right, hello and welcome to yet another value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. And with me today, I'm happy to have on for the second time, Mike Melby. Uh, Mike is a founder and portfolio manager at Gate City Capital. Mike, how's it going? Hey, doing well. Thanks again for having me. Excited to be here. Hey, excited to have you on for the second time. And you know, since it's your second time, you know I start every podcast by pitching you my guest. Uh, guests can go back to the first podcast to hear the full pitch, but I will say, you know, just to add on to that, I will say you're one of the most requested repeat guests, which is kind of surprising because the first stock we talked about was a hundred million dollar kind of little land bank out in Arizona, but it's double since we talked about six months ago. So maybe that's why you're so popular, but look, I enjoyed the last pitch. I'm really looking forward to this one and I'm just uh, happy to have you back on. So that out the way, the company we're talking about today, it's Cato Corp. The ticker is C-A-T-O. I'll just give a blanket disclaimer. This is a little under $400 million market cap company. That's very small. So everyone should remember, not investing in device. Please do your own research. Uh, remember, very small. So you need to be careful with this. But that all said, I'll just flip it over to you. Who is Cato and why are we so interested in them? Yeah, thanks again for having me. Um, Cato uh, is a retailer of women's uh, fashion clothing. They operate 1,300 stores in the United States through uh, three, I guess, separate concepts. One is Cato, one is It's Fashion, and the final one is Versona. Uh, they're a no-frills retailer, all uh, private label merchandise. Um, again, 1,300 stores focused in the southern and southeastern United States, and uh, they've taken an approach that uh, uh, our shoppers, our customers are going to shop in the store. Um, only about 5% of their uh, sales go through the online channel. But um, uh, very long history. Uh, stores have been profitable consistently. Uh, as you see, a lot of retailers go uh, in and out of favor. They've uh, been consistently profitable, uh, generate good free cash flows, and uh, uh, returned a lot of capital to shareholders, which I think we can touch on later as well. But uh, what we're seeing now uh, through the pandemic have maintained a very strong balance sheet as, as Andrew mentioned, a market cap right around $360 million, uh, over $180 million in cash and marketable securities. They're also getting back an additional $33 million um, through uh, uh, prior income tax refunds from the CARES Act. So uh, we're looking at a, an enterprise value of around $150 million. We, we've got them generating well over $50 million of EBITDA. We think a lot of that goes to free cash flow. And uh, at our core, we're uh, value, deep value investors and margin of safety investors. And uh, generally look for companies with uh, some sort of real assets, as, as we talked about AMREP last time with a big land holding in uh, Rio Rancho, New Mexico. But uh, Cato, uh, while they lease all their stores, they own their corporate headquarters and distribution center. Uh, they're located in Charlotte, uh, have 600,000 square feet of space, around 150,000 square feet of office space, 450,000 square feet of uh, distribution space. We think that has significant value. And uh, they're also, they also own 350 acres of land in a southern suburb of Charlotte uh, called Fort Mill, South Carolina. It's called the Southbridge Development. Uh, they've partnered with a local developer, um, have uh, constructed one commercial building on that, still have about 335,000 square feet to go. And uh, it's a very um, popular area. We're seeing a lot of activity there. Uh, a couple of companies looked at it in the past for big corporate headquarters, including the Carolina Panthers, uh, Centene Corporation also looked at it. And uh, we think it's a matter of time before they're able to monetize that for significant value. And uh, finally, they own a 185 acre parcel of industrial land in another Southern suburb of Charlotte. Uh, we think that has uh, a good amount of value too. We value it around $10 million. And uh, we think uh, if the company doesn't sell that, that can be used for uh, a future distribution facility while they could look to monetize some of their Charlotte uh, land and buildings there. Uh, so overall, we see uh, the retail space really opening up um, and uh, people are looking to get out and go shop. And uh, one of the, the subsets cater or Cato caters to is uh, uh, plus size women. And we think uh, with a fair amount of potential weight gain or even weight loss during the pandemic, that people are gonna look out and, and try to get new fashions and clothes that uh, don't remind them of being inside. 
So at, uh, at a high level view, we see uh, a, a company with an extremely strong balance sheet in the retail space. They're not going anywhere. Uh, right around $150 million enterprise value when you take out uh, uh, their income tax receivable and uh, generating uh, north of 50 million in EBITDA and we think well north of 30 million in free cash flow. So uh, that's, that's kind of a summary of uh, uh, why we like it and, and who they are. No, it, look, that's a great overview. And I guess I have two comments on it. First, you mentioned the weight gain in COVID, and I, I'm very familiar with that part of COVID. But second, this is why you're the people's, one of their most requested guests, because look, I, I, yesterday I flipped through the 10K, I put together some notes and stuff. I, I read about the, the real estate and I was kind of like, oh, this is an older company. I'm sure the real estate, they don't own their stores. I'm sure it's negligible. And you're coming out here and hitting me with tens of millions of dollars in potential, uh, some of the parts value there. So uh, I, I want to dive into a couple different things, but let's start. Let's start with Cato, the retail side. The first thing, I believe the first word in their 10K is they target the junior slash Missy side as well as the plus size. And it just strikes me as, as a little bit strange to target junior Missy and plus size women. Am I looking at that correctly? Was I reading that right? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, that, that's correct. And um, just, just visiting their stores, it's kind of split up half and half. And so you have half the store that's uh, more um, junior Missy, which is... Um, Primarily focus more at, uh, um, I guess, the younger demographic, and the other side is is more uh, for plus sizes. And in terms of the store base, and maybe just um, uh, going back to their strategy again, they've they've operated for for fifty plus years. Um, they uh, uh, they focus on strip centers, and so uh, uh, the the whole mall mall concept is a big focus in. in in retail right now and and uh, right around six or seven percent of their stores are actually located in, in mall. The vast majority are, are located in strip centers with about 50 percent of their stores being located near a Walmart yep. or in a, a, a Walmart strip center. And so uh, that, that uh, I think caters well to who their target market is, uh, which is uh, probably uh, at the lower end of the income side, um, all uh, private label clothes, uh, just just perusing through the stores, a lot of uh, materials in kind of the, the 15 to $35 price range. And so I, I think they've been, done a good job of focusing who, uh, focusing on their, uh, on the demographic that, uh, that fits them best and not trying to, to be too much else. Um, so it's uh, it's very, I think it's a very frugal concept. They're focused on making money. In, in terms of stores, there's a store manager, two assistant managers, and then a handful of part-time help. And uh, they've, they've cut back a lot during the pandemic as well. And so their, their total employee count went from 10,000 employees down to 7,500 employees. And so we think they've probably found some ways to operate more efficiently than they have in the past. Uh, but yeah, going back to the, the target market, um, uh, lower end on the, the demographic and, and income side, we think that probably caters more to a, a less online crowd as well. And, and generally in smaller markets where, where uh, women don't have a lot of options to shop, again, located uh, oftentimes by Walmart, where their product's going to be significantly more fashionable than Walmart, but uh, it is much better value point than, than your mall-based retailers. So. Uh, I think going back to your question, those are kind of the target customers with uh, the interesting uh, uh, opening line in the 10K. No, that's perfect. You beat me to my next question. The majority or a, a lot of their stores are kind of focused are next to Walmart, which is perfect. So you can kind of understand their target market a little more. I guess my next question would be, so keeping in mind, Cato, it's a fan, it's still a controlled company. The CEO, he's obviously not the founder. I think he's the gra grandson of the founder, if I'm remembering, but he is 70 years old. And when I think family controlled retailer, 70 year old CEO at the helm, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is a lot of these guys are slow to move into the future. You know, I think Dillard's, which didn't really have an online strategy, even though that somehow became a meme stock, these guys, less than 5% of their sales are online. And you could look at it two ways, right? I think the, the nice way to look at it would be, they don't have a lot of, they don't have a great brand, a lot of online distribution. And th so they're just playing in places where they can make money. It's smart not to do this. The other way you could look at it is, hey, online is the future. They've got a 70-year-old CEO. It's kind of tired, tired, stale store base. And they're not, they're not really making that investment because it's not what he wants to do. This is what happens with older family-controlled mall companies. So I guess I, I threw a lot out there at you, but if you could just kind of comment on overarching how you look at both the, the lack of online sales and the family-controlled aspect. Yeah, uh, so just on the family 
control the aspect. Uh, John Cato controls 40, uh, approximately 48% of the voting shares uh, through around a 12% economic interest. And so there are two classes of shares and uh, the, the stake he owns has 10 times um, voting rights. And so uh, while, while it's not centrally controlled with 48% for, for all, all purposes, he, he controls the company. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think there are uh, several ways to approach it. And I, I think the way the companies approach it, and, and maybe they're behind it, maybe they um, made a huge misstep here, but uh, they're, they're focused on ways to, to make money. And I think uh, with the significant economic interest of, of John Cato that he uh, he wants to make money and he's not interested in doing investments in um, technology that doesn't generate a return. And so they, they do have an online presence. You can go to Cato.com or Persona.com, um, which uh, Persona is more of a, an accessory store than is their mall-based concept in a, in a higher level uh, income consumer, but uh, uh, right around 100 persona stores just for, for background there. Uh, but uh, they'll they'll sell online, but they don't want to uh, have it degrade their profit margins. And so I, I think going forward, um, they'll do what they think makes them the most money in the current environment. Uh, I, again, their their customers like the shopping experience. They like being in store, and uh, uh, they try to make it a store where it's a social activity. Um, and and again, a lot of uh, their stores are in locations where you don't have a lot of options, um, and uh, try to coordinate the store so you can pick out a full outfit. And uh, we, we'll see how kind of uh, spending goes in terms of. Uh, uh, apparel purchases going forward, but um, it's it, it is always helpful to try clothes on to see how it looks to make sure it looks the way uh, you think it looks. And uh, I, I think from a Walmart standpoint too, you're uh, a big amount of their customers are going into the store and, and shopping physically in the area. So um, uh, overall, I think it's it's a space where the company does not want to invest in things that make them less money and uh, subsidize the online experience for the in-person experience. And uh, historically, it's uh, been a very profitable um, mode for them. And uh, I guess going forward as well, a lot of, uh, we, we think they've been able to renegotiate the leases on a lot of their locations. Uh, leases run from one to five years. And uh, in the event that a store is not profitable, um, average leases between two and a half, three years, and they're coming do each year, uh, we, we think the company can uh, migrate out of that fixed cost base if it's no longer profitable for them. Uh, we, don't, we don't see that happening right now, but uh, they've kept their flexibility open in terms of fixed costs. They're not 10 year uh, high rent areas that they're gonna be stuck in for a long time. So uh, we think that mitigates some of the risk there too. And in the meantime, they're generating a lot of cash. Perfect. I, we'll come back to management in a second, but let me ask you about that fixed cost store base because one of the things I noticed when reading the 10K, they peaked at just under 1,400 stores in 2016. That drops that from, it was 1,372, I think is the actual number, drops to 1,281 by the end of 2019. So actually pre-COVID, they've cut 100 stores. You know, that's more than 5% of their store base. This is relatively meaningful. But in the past year, it looks like they net opened about 50 stores, which I was surprised, you know. The past year includes the COVID area. So they um, they were kind of expanding during COVID. And one of the cool things about this company and a lot of my craft companies, there's not a lot out there on there, right? Like they don't do investor calls. They don't have investor presentations. So I'm only pulling this from the, the 10K to say this, and they don't give a lot of description. So I'm wondering for you, like, how do you look at the store base, at how it's evolved, you know, first shrinking for five years and kind of growing over the past year? Yeah, we, we think over the time the company will continue to look to grow their store base and uh, should be able to take advantage of a lot of competitors that have uh, closed up shop in, in their key areas and, and in attractive rent areas. But uh, for our assumptions going forward, we have the store base staying right around 1,300 stores, uh, which may be a bit conservative. As, as you mentioned, they, they increased their store count in, in 2020, and uh, uh, that, that was due to commitments made prior to COVID. And so it was so pre-COVID commitments. They were actually planning to expand pre-COVID. 
They, they were exactly. And, and they put those expansion plans on hold. I think they just want to uh, get on a little firmer footing in terms of expectations on the store model and, and um, also see what opportunities become available. Um, they're, they're looking to close uh, around 25 stores in this fiscal year. So we think that'll come down a bit and then uh, likely look to grow it over time. And so um, uh, we, we assume a flat store base. Uh, I think the company feels that uh, there's stores and locations they can expand to that, that are profitable, but I want to be a little sure on the uh, COVID environment and where we are at coming out of the pandemic before uh, committing to more uh, store expansion. So we've got them staying right around 1,300 stores, but I think there's upside potential there. It makes tons of sense. That makes some sense. Well, let me turn back to management here because one of the things I'm really impressed by, there were so many companies that shut off the share repurchase programs during COVID and just haven't come close to turning back on, especially re especially physical-based retail companies. And this company, I, I, I think at the height of COVID, they paused it, but they got pretty aggressive with their repurchase towards the end of last year and start of this year. They're, they're buying back a lot of shares. So I look at this company and again, I look and I say, hey, these guys are not afraid to step into a share price that is pretty low and say, let's retire shares, even though the environment is very uncertain, and very rocky. And I think that's going to turn out to be a great investment. But the counter is, you know, I come back to the CEO, I'm like, hey, this guy, he's willing to, he's willing to shrink the store base from 2016 to 2019, when the stores might not be profitable. He's willing to buy back shares at the height of uncertainty. But at the same time, he doesn't have an online presence. And, you know, I think if you look at the companies that I was just copying in some indexes, you know, they're, they've way underperformed. He took over a CEO in May 1999. I think they've way overperformed, outperformed, underperformed, I'm sorry, underperformed the Russell over that 21 year period. So again, I'm of two minds here. So could you kind of touch on both the share repurchase program and how you're looking at the history of this company's management? Yeah, and uh, uh, the share repurchase program, they've been, uh, while the stock price has not uh, performed well over its reign, they have been very uh, active in returning capital to shareholders. And we tracked it going back to 2009, the company's returned $350 million in dividends. So I, I think uh, uh, as you look about share price performance, it, it is good to add back the, the $350 million dollars in dividends over 12 years, which is uh, a return. And, and maybe it is a total return calculation, but sometimes- I, th I, I thought I totally as, returned as it, but you know, who knows? Who knows? You, you I, probably I did, but um, um, and uh, they've, they've bought back uh, $200 million uh, right around there in stock over that time. And, and to your point, they were really aggressive last year in, in terms of repurchasing shares. Um, they, they repurchased almost $20 million of stock at, at under $10 a share. And this was at a time when uh, sales were still down 20% and there was still, a, as there is today, a, a, a large amount of uncertainty on, on the COVID environment. And I think um, uh, going into uh, the pandemic where, where so many retailers have, have, have failed, um, they uh, went into the pandemic with almost $200 million of cash and securities on the balance sheet. And I, I think from a, uh, flexibility standpoint, even when when generating all that cash and returning it to shareholders, that they've been able to uh, utilize um, uh, the significant flexibility that uh, uh, both their asset base and, and their cash base provides to take a contrarian view when when others are are uh, not as positive on the long term outlook. So. Um, from a share repurchase or a, a capital allocation standpoint, uh, I think recently it's it, it's been contrarian and, and is very value accretive. And uh, just in Q1, which um, uh, ends at the end of April, they repurchased another $5 million of stock, which is uh, significant with their market gap and, and enterprise value. And we think that'll all be value accretive to, um, uh, to shareholders. Um, and I lost the second part of your question, I guess, uh, just in terms of managing through the cycle. I, I think they focus on on what they're good at. And uh, th there have been a lot of retailers that, that have done poorly and a lot of their peers that are, are no longer around. And so I think they've, they've built the company for, for long-term success. I, uh, they were certainly hurt by, by the COVID pandemic uh, with, with sales in Q2 falling uh, well over 50%. And, um, down more than 20% last year. Despite all that, they just lost operating cash flow. They lost $30 million last year. 
which is, um, uh, I think, a, a pretty amazing achievement given uh, how their industry was decimated and I think uh, have set themselves up well here going forward. Um, you, you mentioned in 2016 to 2018 how they closed stores. And uh, that was a, a time when the company struggled from a, from a profitability standpoint. And, and they blamed it on a, a switch from uh, being focused on, on kind of the target market we, we talked about before to really catering to uh, uh, women with uh, a, a smaller build. And so they, they repositioned their, their clothes and their assortment to, to be more geared to a, a millennial type buyer. And uh, that, that really hurt their sales. It, it alienated their core customer. They saw uh, comps um, uh, decline at a high single digit rate and their profitability really contracted. And uh, I, I think to their credit, they recognized that that, that approach was wrong. They brought in, uh, they brought back their old vendors. They, they started sourcing again to target uh, uh, their, uh, the demographic that liked them best. And so um, uh, in, in 2019 or the fiscal year right, right before the pandemic, comps were again positive. And I think they uh, had, uh, again, figured out who they, they were and um, uh, their credit were able to, to transition back to, to serve their target customer. And I think they're, they're, they're focused right there right now. So, um, um, yeah, the years 2016 to 2018 were, were rough years, and they they closed stores as a result. But uh, uh, going going back to the beginning of 2020, uh, they they felt at that time that they had the model figured out again that they could grow store their store base profitably, and were planning to do that. And then everyone kind of hit the big uh, pandemic um, roadblock. But uh, we think they're by that now. Yeah, no, it's for and, and it's funny because. Everybody wants to capture the millennial audience and get bigger, but you say, "Hey, we're Cato. We target plus size women, and we're in the, we're in strip malls next to Walmart." You're like, "We're going to switch to millennial buyers." You kind of look at the show and say, "Oh, maybe maybe you company Cato company who doesn't have an online presence, maybe you're not the right person to go after millennials." So seems seems easy in hindsight, but good for them for shutting it down. Let's go over to so you mentioned three. I'm just using your numbers from the beginning. 360 million market cap, about $180 million in cash brings you to $180 million EV. Plus you get another $30 million tax credit, which would take you down to $150 million EV. And again, I read through the 10K and I kind of just dismissed the, the land, but based on what you were saying earlier, that land in Charlotte, I mean, Charlotte is a growth area. I, I, I like that city. I, I've tried to talk my wife into moving there and she's told me, Andrew, you've only spent a couple hours there. You can't, you can't know you want to move there, but you know, that, that land's obviously super valuable. So how are you looking at that land? And maybe we can just use that to roll into a, some of the parts for Cato. Yeah, exactly. Um, just in terms of their, both their headquarters and their distribution facility, we don't, we don't ascribe any additional value to, to that when, when we're thinking about the fair value of the company. Uh, the, the tax assessed value of, of those 600,000 square feet is right around $25 million. Uh, we, we the headquarters, 600,000 square feet? That's right, uh, and we think that's significantly, well, we think that's too low. So we think fair value is probably closer to $50 million. Uh, now that is needed to both operate the business at the headquarters and uh, uh, all their clothes coming through the distribution facility so that that's essential to the business and we're not advocating a, a sale and lease back or anything like that. But in, in the event that um, uh, from a margin of safety standpoint, if, if uh, a bad environment for sales. We think that could be a source of value for them. Uh, the Southbridge uh, development uh, we, we think has significant value. And uh, again, they, they own 335 acres in a southern suburb of uh, Charlotte called uh, Fort Mill, South Carolina. It's uh, right off the interstate. I think it's Interstate 77 and uh, the, the road or the overpass that goes to um, their subdivision, it um, it's being redone and completed this year. So we think it, it'll allow a lot of easy access uh, to uh, companies that, that look to potentially headquarter there. Uh, they have completed one building on the site. It was the corporate headquarters of a company called Round Point Mortgage. Uh, Cato contributed 15 acres of land. Uh, Round Point built their headquarters. The total cost was 35 to $40 million. Um, and Cato partnered with uh, a North Carolina de developer called Lincoln Harris in order to complete that. And they're working on 
uh, getting demand for the entire subdivision. Uh, Cato and Lincoln Harris recently sold that. Uh, Cato received proceeds of just north of $3 million and booked a $2 million gain on that sale. Um, so we think uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, through their uh, land interest, we think there was probably some, some leverage that, that was put on that and then Lincoln Harris did a lot of the other equity and development work. Um, we, we think that can be something that's a similar model for the rest of the development where Cato contributes the land and uh, a, a developer uh, looks to build it out. And um, yeah, as I mentioned there, it's been considered, uh, there are a, a lot of competing developments here. And uh, what's, what's happened over time is this is in the state of South Carolina. And uh, historically, South Carolina has had a lot of incentives for businesses to, to come on in. And uh, the Charlotte area has picked up um, uh, kind of the competition there recently, which I think is, is um, sending eventually headquartered in Charlotte. Um, Carolina Panthers are actually going to be in uh, uh, another suburb of, of South Carolina. But um, overall, limited amount of land, we think a lot of groups are, 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 are living there or, or relocating there. And uh, uh, we think it'd be a good location for hotels, offices, retail. And uh, I, I think they're, they're keeping their options open. It's, it's not a great time to build, I think even at this point, offices and hotels. And so a lot of the conversations they were having in the past were put on hold. But uh, we see, see that abating as concerns about the pandemic uh, uh, slow. And uh, we, we think it can be a very value creative, low risk way for the company to add value over time. So um, in, in terms of value, we, we value it at around $100,000 an acre for their remaining 335 acres, which is um, call it $33 million of, of value to the company. We, we think it could be a lot more than that depending on, on how things go, but um, uh, that's, it's, it's tough to find comparables for uh, such a big parcel, but a lot of commercial land there trades north of $200,000 an acre uh, for land that you can develop into um, hotels or retail or, or offices. Uh, so it, it's tough to tell the time frame. I think if a big uh, corporate campus comes in, it can be monetized very quickly. But um, uh, if, if that does not occur, we think there'll be uh, coming up here probably a, a building or two that goes up each year and and uh, both allows the company to uh, create more value off of its land and uh, potentially monetize a, a good chunk of that going forward. Perfect. So uh, I was trying to keep track of all the numbers as you as you threw the this the some of the parts at me. But I I guess the way to think about it is right now sixteen fifty or so per share that comes out to about a three hundred sixty million dollar market cap. One hundred and eighty million of net cash on the balance sheet would take you down to one hundred eighty. $30 million of tax receipt coming back takes you down to 150. Uh, $25 million tax assessed headquarters. You guys think it might be worth 50 million, but call it 25. That takes you down to 125. $30 million of value for the, the other acreage they own around Charlotte. That would take you down below 100. And you can see why this is so interesting to Mike, because in 2019, pre pandemic, they did 53 million in cash flow from operations and $8 million in CapEx. So you're paying about two times free cash flow. You know, that's after tax, after CapEx, everything, free cash flow. You're paying two times that to some of the parts. Am I looking at that correctly? Yeah, that's, uh, you summed it up really well. And uh, uh, as an example, in Q1, they EPS of 92 cents. We, uh, results will be volatile and it's tough to predict the back half of the year, but uh, we, we think they do somewhere between $1.50 and 225 in EPS. And uh, you started a, a $16 in, 50 cent share price after cash, you take it down to the $8 range and after the tax refund, excluding all real estate, you're at around $6.50 net of cash. And they did 92 cents of EPS in Q1. And we, we think uh, to somewhere between 150 and 225 over uh, this fiscal year. And it, it seems to be trading in kind of the four, four times EPS type range, uh, X cash and, and the cash they expect to have coming in. Um, so, so we think that's, uh, that, that's valuable and, or that's a, an attractive value to us. And, uh, I think it could be for others as well. You know who this is the, in the wheelhouse for, this is wall street bets. This is their wheelhouse right here. Like 
cl- retailer with a decades old history right next to Walmart, no online sales. This is what they need. We need to get this over on Reddit real quick. Yeah, that sounds exciting. And uh, yeah, there have been a number of retailers and we think uh, a lot of excitement in the retail space just on, on the reopening. And, and we've seen a number of, of small uh, micro cap retailers and, uh, that that have done really well over this period, over excitement, over the reopening. And, and Kato's done well. Uh, it, the stock has also performed well, but we think uh, from a valuation standpoint, it, it's still looking really, really attractive versus everything. I, yep, 100%. I guess the last thing I want to touch on here, $360 million market cap, over $200 million in cash after we include the tax refund and whatever they're going to generate this quarter and everything. So over 50% of the market cap is in cash. I think we know that a lot of the capital allocation is going to go to shareholder returns, right? They pay the dividend, they're buying back stock pretty aggressively. Maybe that would change if the stock ran up a lot, but we can be pretty confident that at these levels, a lot of it's going to capital returns. But it does, you know, again, the CEO is 70. Everyone on the board, I think the youngest board member, if I'm doing this from memory, was 63 or so. So I I do kind of look at this and say, hey, what is the end game for a family controlled, all physical retailer where a lot of our returns are going to be dependent on how they use this cash and what they decide to do? So if you could just touch on that for a second. Yeah, I think the dividend is something I did touch on that that you brought up as well, but but pre-pandemic, they were paying uh, 33 cents a quarter uh, or a uh, dollar and 32 cents a year in dividends. They, they did uh, stop the dividend during the pandemic. Uh, they recently reinstated it at 11 cents a quarter. So uh, 44 cents a year or a yield uh, just just below 3%. And uh, just in terms of use of cash, they, uh, we haven't touched on it directly, but they they have too much cash on the balance sheet. I mean, they, they survived COVID with, um, uh, earning just $30 million in, in operating cash flow and uh, uh, really don't need uh, what, what comes out to be $200 million north of, of cash and securities. Which to burn $30 million during COVID, I mean, that it, it is unbelievable. For Because remember, this is a story, and yes, they have no debt, but they have 1,300 operating leases they had to pay. And you know, they were south, Southeastern, so they could probably open a lot sooner than your we're both in the north, a lot sooner than the north. But still, the traffic was day to, way down. They had to shut down to only burn thirty million. I mean, it, it's a credit to the management team, and it also says, hey, if in an environment when your stores really couldn't operate, if that's all you could burn, that's all you burnt, maybe you do deserve a higher multiple than four or five or six x whatever you're trading for right now. Sorry, that was my tangent. Go ahead. Oh yeah, and um, I, I think going forward. Um, they used to pay a, a, a dividend that was three times as high as the one they declared now. Uh, we think, uh, assuming that the results come back anywhere near as strong as we think they will, that uh, uh, the dividend will return to somewhere in the 30 to, to 40 cents a quarter range and uh, bring that dividend yield um, up from, from call it so 3% up to 8 to, to 10%. And, and we think that, uh, that provides uh, both another investor base, but uh, overall a, a return of capital. And uh, we, we think the company uh, balances out where they think the value of their stock should be with, with how they return capital. So uh, again, started the repurchase program before um, restarting the dividend program, which, which we think was just, a um, they, they thought the stock was, just, was way, way undervalued at the time they repurchased it. So so we would aggressively do that. And uh, in, in terms of kind of what what the company might look like in uh, five or ten years, it, it's difficult to tell. What 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 we think is kind of our base case is uh, John Cato continues to lead the company. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned kind of the, the tenure of the board, but uh, the senior management of the team um, has been there a, a long time. And we we think um, and. Uh, uh, unlike, I, I think, a number of retail concepts where you've seen a lot of management turnover and a lot of people coming in to fix things, uh, the, the team here has been uh, very consistent over time. And, and a lot of the, the C-suite is, is 20 plus years of experience all in Cato. So uh, we, we think there are people there that can take over in terms of what occurs um, 
uh, uh, should John Cato not be there anymore, it's, it's difficult to, to tell, but we think from an operating standpoint, they're still in good hands. And uh, from an operation standpoint, if they want to continue on the path they are, they're not needing an influx in the town. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add there is they had a chart in their proxy, average years of service by position. And, and I was pretty struck, you know, the average for a sales associate, the average years of service is two years, which strikes me as pretty high for kind of a mall based retailer to have two years of average tenure just at the sales associate. And then it goes way up from there. Store manager, six years, district manager, 15. The C-suite is, you know, 10 plus. So yeah, I, I was really struck by the the length of tenure of just the employees and stuff. I, I never know if that's a probably at the C-suite, it's probably a good sign. I never know if it's a good sign or a bad sign, but I, I was just impressed by it. It struck me as atypical for a retailer. Yeah, and they have the promoter within mentality. I think they say 80% of their uh, management is, is promoted from within. And I think they like to build the culture and, and train people the way they, they want to train people. So I think it creates a... I don't want to say a family, but uh, a, a group of employees that uh, know the company well and uh, know who their customer is and uh, just serve, uh, serve that customer. Yeah. And just bringing it back to management. So Cato is 70. Uh, it sounds to me like what you're saying is he's, your feel is he wants to run this for a while. And even if he's not the management team behind him, they're going to keep this going. There's no, you know, cause you see CEO who's 70 owns a lot of stock. My first thought also goes to succession planning. Is he going to look to sell this to private equity, sell this to a bigger buyer? He's 70, which is young in the corporate world, but you know, it's always in the back of your mind. Yeah, I think both of those are options. Our, our base case is he wants to stay on probably as long as, as he feels he's, he's able to. And uh, um, I think uh, kind of growing up in the industry, it's what kind of his namesake company that uh, uh, base case is he'll want to be in control of and be at the helm for uh, as long as he's able to physically go to work. So, um, yeah, we, we, we don't see anything changing there and uh, feel, feel comfortable with how he's allocated capital before that uh, he's going to do it in, in a way that's beneficial to all shareholders. Perfect, perfect. Look, I, I think we, we've hit just about everything I had in the notes on Cato. It, it's nice, you know, you it's so easy to get caught up in studying the latest synthetic biotech company coming public at a 10 billion valuation. But I, I was enjoying myself reading, you know, it's a pretty simple 10 K they didn't even have earnings calls. So I didn't have to go read the earnings calls transcripts. It's pretty, pretty simple company, but anything else you think we should be talking about with Cato? Yeah, I think, I think you hit on a good thing there in terms of um, uh, they're not a promotional company. And so maybe others want to promote it and uh, maybe I'm doing that here today, but uh, that's your uh, no. job. That's why you're coming on the podcast. <laughs> Yeah, no, no earnings calls, uh, really no uh, uh, IR presentations or, or anything like that. So I think they can uh, fly under the radar for a lot of people. Um, just, yeah, our, our history on the company from a, a team standpoint, we followed them since probably 2017 or 2018. And uh, in uh, 2018, my, my colleague, Nick Bodner, who who has really led our law our process there. So I have to give a shout out to Nick and all the work he's done there. But we went down to visit their headquarters and uh, just, just in terms of our investment process, especially pre-pandemic, we made a point to go and see and uh, meet people whenever possible and see the facilities and, and, and see the land holdings. So um, um, yeah, we, we went down there. We were very impressed. The corporate headquarters looks looks new. It's, uh, it's a nice building uh, and uh, we, we had a good meeting with the team um, and uh, then went to their two land holdings. So uh, we, we went down to the South Bridge development and um, uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I should go into it a little bit more, but it's the former home of the Charlotte Knights uh, minor league baseball team. And so that's, they bought that out of bankruptcy for $10 million or so in 2012 and uh, just kind of held on to it. And then, and announced plans to kind of move forward with their own development. But uh, uh, Daimler Chrysler has an office building there. There's a school not far away. And uh, from a development standpoint, it's, I, we think it's a good area for a corporate campus. And uh, it, it looked like a place where, where people would want to um, live and work. So uh, that, that made it exciting to us, especially in a growing area. And uh, the other land holding that, that we really don't value as well is uh, 185 uh, acres in Rock Hill, 
South Carolina. And that's where the Carolina Panthers are relocating to. And uh, they've got 185 acres there. We think that's just a land bank for them now. And um, uh, there are a couple other distribution facilities there, again, right by the interstate. And uh, it's, uh, uh, we don't think that's gonna be monetized in the near term if they keep that as an option um, for, for future expansion, but it's there and it has value. So um, that, that's a point we try to make is go and see stuff in, in our visit. Um, uh, kind of less to believe that there's a lot of land and, and property value and a good management team in place. And just in terms of our process, we, uh, um, as, as the pandemic struck, we, we took a really close look at it and it fell below kind of our target of where we, we wanted to own the company at and probably got in a little too soon, but then uh, looked at looked at as it, it fell further and uh, uh, thought just from an asset value standpoint, we, we gained a lot of comfort in, in the concept and, and in their land holdings and assets. And um, that's, that was kind of our process as, as we moved through our diligence process that started a few years ago to, to purchasing and where we're at now. That's perfect. You know what I like about this story? I, I do love that you guys had visited it. Like this is one thing I, I've tried to tell people, like a, a lot of investing to me is you've done the work and then something crazy happens, right? And because you've already done the work and in your case, you had visited the company in 2018, probably not expecting a global pandemic that shuts down the whole country, but you know, you've done the work, something crazy happens, the stock drops 20% or the stock's up 10, but you've done the work and you know, the stock dropped 20% and it should have gone up four or it goes up 10, but you've already done the work and this news comes out and you say, this should be up a hundred percent on this news. And a lot of investing to me is like the windows can be pretty brief. And I'm not saying this is the only way to invest, right? But a lot of times the big alpha is where you've done the work. There's a two day window where the market thinks this is one thing. And you think this is another, obviously this was a pandemic difference, but you had done the work before. Let me ask you uh, two quick questions to follow up on what you said. Uh, you mentioned, and you mentioned our talk on AXR, you guys obviously like to do a lot of in-person diligence of companies. I do as well. I have not since the COVID. I'm just asking in general, for my knowledge, have you guys started visiting companies again? Have y'all find them receptive to, uh, to the scene investors? Yeah, uh, we we've started the process within the last month or two, and um, it's it, it's a tricky process as you don't uh, uh, there's there's still a lot of uh, health precautions you want to take both for our team and then also for for everyone we're visiting. So uh, we uh, once we were vaccinated and uh, in, in the event that the companies we're visiting are are comfortable with in person visitors, we we try to be just very respectful and make sure they know or we know going going into it what. Uh, their expectations are and what their office setting is. Uh, for the most part, it's uh, we, we've done a, call it three to five over the last month. So we've tried to pick it up, but uh, it, there, there have been good visits. I think companies have been appreciative of, of showing interest. And uh, I think overall, especially for firms that have taken the approach that uh, uh, a lot of us are in the office, it's refreshing to see people and to uh, get out and, and interact again. So it's been uh, it's been nice to do that. And it's been something that you, you just recently started. Yeah, I, I haven't started visiting, but I've just started going back, you know, meeting lots of friends at bars and stuff. And it's nice, but you do kind of get that, where do I put my arms, where do I put my hands? I'm not used to being around people anymore. Uh, more company specific question. You mentioned that they own another 183 acres, I think you said, of land next to where the Panthers are moving. Is that the Panthers' new stadium, or is that the Panthers' new headquarters? Uh, it's their new corporate headquarters. So uh, they they like to relocate. I think uh, a year or two back, and so they're the stadium's staying, but the, I think it'll be a new practice facility and, and corporate headquarters for the team, and and that brings with it a fair amount of tourism and visitors and things like that. So so along with that, um, while while the Panthers' new facility is in in the 185 acres that. That Cato owns, we do think it will bring a lot of activity. I think the price tag of the whole thing or the economic impact was $2 billion that, that was expected. So we think that um, it certainly can't hurt for, for land prices in the year. No, I, I was just wondering because headquarters and practice facility are really nice. Obviously, that's going to bring money and stuff around. But if you're talking, if this if there was a new stadium getting built, right, we're, we're talking just huge fortunes. I I'm not aware of too many, but you can make a lot of money. The Atlanta Braves, they've got all that, Liberty Braves, they've got all that land around the, the new SunTrust Stadium. I mean, that land, they are making so much money out of it because people love to live near ballparks and stadiums. Yeah, it's uh, a good clarification. The, 
the the uh, this, the stadium is now located there. But yeah, we think uh, 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 especially kind of in the current environment, people like to be um, or have increasingly like to be where where stadiums are. And you've seen a lot of redevelopment in cities next to uh, big tourist locations that draw people in. So we'll see how uh, our 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 thought is in kind of returns post pandemic when people feel comfortable being in crowds again. But that was certainly a trend. Uh, beforehand, and think we'll go back to that as well. So, um, yeah, we, we agree with that. Honestly. Perfect. Well, hey, Mike, this was great. Uh, it's a good, simple value uh, investment. And I mean that in the best way, right? Like you can read the 10K, you can make a decision. Great capital returns here, very cheap multiple. And you even threw in some little spicy extras that I like that I, I hadn't even seen on a first glance with the, the tax refund, the land, and all that. So, this is great. Mike, Thank you so much for coming back on. It was wonderful having you and looking forward to having you on for the third time. Hey, Andrew, great to see you again. Thanks uh, Thanks for the interest in the questions and uh, happy to help with any questions for any listeners that might be out there uh, on, on Kato or anything else. So, yeah, and uh, how, how can listeners reach you? I think I've got your contact info in the last podcast. I'll be sure to co- include it, but how, how would you like people to reach you? The Gate City website? Uh, yeah, that has uh, uh, a link to our uh, kind of corporate email. That's fine. Or if people want to email me directly, I'm, I'm okay with that too. It's MLB, which is M M E L B Y at gatecitycap.com. Perfect. Well, if you listen this far, you've got his personal email address. If not, I'll have the link to the Gate City website in the show notes. But, Mike, thanks again for coming on. Looking forward to chatting soon. Hey, great seeing you. Thanks again.